All right, guys, ready for lucky video number 13? Oh, you like my new father? Another new Father's Day shirt? Our dad is not one in a million. Our dad is one in a million. Oh, I'm one in a million. Nerd humor. All right. So we have finally arrived to where we want to get. Well, depending if you want to be here or not. <laughs> I'd much rather be at the beach or uh, or the driving or something. Yeah. We are non-standard conditions now. Everything we've been doing, these first 12 videos for electrochemistry, although the first four were just review from last semester on redox, we've been doing standard conditions only. So it's so limiting to be stuck at an activity of one or a one molar solution. Well, how many times in lab are we not at a solution of one molar, right? <laughs> like most of the time. So we really need to figure out how to calculate cell potential if we're at non-standard conditions, right? Commonly, we're at a 0.1 molar solution or a 0.25 or a, a 2 or 3 molar. What do we do? We ran into this exact same problem in thermodynamics. Ho, 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 right? We were doing... Gibbs energy changes at standard conditions over and over, especially from those tables, right? From the thermo tables. And we go, well, what if we're not at standard conditions? What if we don't have gases at pressures of one bar or one atmosphere, those kinds of things? All right? Solids and liquids, of course, will have activities of one. What we did is we took the Gibbs energy at standard conditions, just added a correction factor to get Gibbs energy changes at non-standard conditions. That correcting correction factor was just the gas constant, the temperature in Kelvin, and the natural log of oh, the reaction quotient Q. Remember, it's a lot like the equilibrium constant, just with initial conditions or non-standard conditions in this case. That was sweet. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you remember that equation, but that's one of the big three from uh, thermodynamics. Well, maybe we can utilize this and treat electrochemistry the same way. There's a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity between some of the equations. I wonder if, if we needed E cell at non-standard conditions, I wonder if that would just be E not cell, right, at standard conditions that we could calculate using our tables here, right, like we've been doing for the last 12 videos. We could easily calculate E not cell at, not, at standard conditions. But maybe it's just, maybe it's at non-standard conditions, it's e, e cell at standard conditions plus some correction factor dealing with the concentrations of those species not being at one molar. So we obviously need some term that accounts for the concentration changes of species to show how E cell changes with concentration. Hey, well, isn't there an equation that relates delta G naught? to electrochemistry, we could just substitute it in there. Oh, let's do that on the next board and derive the Nernst equation. You ready to do some more algebraic substitution? Go, we do that so much in Chem 185, it's crazy. Second semester, well, that's what we call second semester general chemistry, where we uh, have our classes, Chem 185. I don't know where it is, where you have learned it. So we've got this equation from thermodynamics, right? Gibbs energy at non-standard conditions equals the Gibbs energy change at standard conditions plus the correction factor, including the reaction quotient. But we know we can connect electrochemistry to thermodynamics, right? Delta G naught is negative Z F E naught cell, and same thing's true at non-standard conditions. Delta G is negative Z F E cell, electron number, Faraday's constant. Well, let's plug those in. Let's plug in that term for delta G at non-standard conditions, let's plug in this term for delta G naught at standard conditions plus RT log Q. Do you see an equation forming? We got the thermodynamics out. We got the electrochemistry in. Can we divide through by negative ZF? Divide through by the negative sign, the electron number, and Faraday's constant? Do that for me real quick and see if you can derive the equation for the cell voltage or cell potential at non-standard conditions. Go for it. I have no idea why I just paused my video. I don't need to pause it to do it. <laughs> I keep thinking, I tell you guys to pause it and do it, thinking I need to pause it myself. Anyway, let's divide through by negative ZF across the board. And what are we going to end up with? 
we're going to get E cell equals E not cell. Right? So at non-standard conditions, we'll be equal to the standard condition cell potential minus RT over ZF. You see that term pop up a lot, don't you? RT over ZF times log of the reaction quotient. This is called the Nernst. I love this equation. What a cool last name, Nernst. <laughs> That's a perfect name for a scientist. I'm, I'm Professor Nernst. <laughs> Walter Nernst, late 1800s. Holy moly, what did this guy not do? Um, read through some of the history this phenomenal, phenomenal scientist and the contributions. Not only was a major factor in electrochemistry in there with Faraday and stuff, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe Nernst also had something to do with uh, KSP values, solubility product constants for equilibrium with solids and saturated solutions, which would kind of make sense because there's a relation with uh, uh, equilibrium here. But I think he... Uh, put together the third law of thermodynamics too, with a, a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin having a zero entropy, creating uh, that's, that uh, ability to determine absolute entropies for any species, because we got that zero reference. So, so phenomenal, it's kind of like Lord Kelvin, right? Just had their hands in so many different pies, it's unbelievable. So this is a great, great equation. So we've got non-standard conditions here. And again, what does that mean? It means we are at concentrations other than an activity of one, right? And we're just using molarity of one for simplification. So this would be standard conditions right here. I will provide you this equation on exams. This to me is the big culmination equation of this chapter, dealing with things at non-standard conditions, right? So of course we need the concentration. So Q is the products, ratio of their power, power of their stoichiometric coefficients over the reactants, concentrations, ratio of the power of their stoichiometric coefficients. You, you we can't get away from that. So this we can calculate using tables as long as we know the uh, cathode and anode half reactions. R is a constant. We need to know the temperature. Z is the electron number from combining the half reactions. Faraday is constant. And then Q you can determine from the overall reaction. So just do what we've been doing uh, to calculate E naught cell. And in the last video, we took E naught cell and Z and calculated the equilibrium constant. Now we're going to take E naught cell and Z and calculate E cell at non-standard conditions. So we'll do an example, show you how it works out. Now there's different forms of the Nernst equation. He originally put it together with a base 10 log. So he had the LOG term, which gives you like a two point something, two or three, uh, the, the factor between natural logs and base 10 logs. I don't know that number off the top of my head. So it looks similar, just have this, this some number there, uh, and then an LOG. So a lot of people still use that. We're not going to because I like how this parallels the thermodynamic one with the, with the natural log. Works out really nice. Then you don't have that dumb constant in there. And of course, a lot of people will use a simplified equation like we did in the last video. If you're at 25 degrees Celsius or 298.15 Kelvin, you can take R, T, and F and combine it into one constant. So you just have E naught cell minus a constant divided by Z times log Q. Yeah, that's, that's nice candy and ice cream flavor of the month there, but what if you're not at 25.0? How, how often are you in lab at 25 point degrees Celsius? That's pretty hot in lab. You're gonna be sweating, my friends. Um, we're usually, I, I, you know, I'm in Southern California and we rarely get above 22, 23 in lab in the Celsius range. So I am a fan of this. I'm not a fan of the simplified equation where you're at the 25.0 degrees Celsius because you just get trapped into the thing where you're using that equation and you just make the assumption it works for every temperature. You forget that this is temperature dependent by using that other equation. It's okay to use it if you're at 25.0 degrees Celsius, but that's what I'm going to give you on exams in my class. I'm not going to give you the other one. So I would highly recommend if you're doing homeworks and stuff, use this equation. Practice like the game, the championship game. When I'm coaching softball, I'm coaching baseball, we're going to practice just like we're going to be playing at the tournament championship game. You don't want to do, this happened to me when I was in track. 
in high school. Um, wasn't coached much at all. So I ran the 400 meter, I ran all the sprints. I did the 400 meter dash and I started in a stand up position all the way through my senior year and got good enough to get to the state championship finals. And literally I'm, pra I'm minutes away from running in, in the, the qualifying heat for the state championship. And my coach walks up, didn't say much, you know, the whole season. He says, maybe you should try starting out of the blocks. I'm like, dude, in a couple minutes, I'm running the qualifier, the, the preliminary heat. <laughs> so I'm getting blocked. Totally changed my whole method of running at the last moment. That would have been nice to have known when I was practicing months and months and months, or if not years prior to that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, don't try to study for exams while you're practicing like it's going to be on the exam. Use this equation. Hopefully that analogy made sense to you. Let's do an example problem of this. Here's the type of problem you'll see on your exams. Again, sometimes I'll give you the overall equation. Sometimes I'll give you the cell line notation. Sometimes I'll give you a picture of the beakers and stuff, although that's hard to draw on an exam. I probably wouldn't give you that weird picture. I might have you draw that, but... All right, what is E cell? You can see it doesn't have the little not symbol. So this is an implication. What's implication? It's an implication you're calculating something at non-standard conditions. Bing, 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 bing. Only one equation, Nernst equation. <laughs> Test taking is about problem recognition. Recognize the problem quickly and just start banging out. No, throw the equation in and do the steps. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Boom, 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 boom. If you sit there going, because you haven't done your homework and you're, you don't even know how to start the problem, you're never going to finish the exams. It's never going to happen. It's like being ready for a, a, a softball or baseball game and you're playing shortstop and you haven't been practicing and someone hits it to you and you're like, Ugh! your brain freezes for a half a second. That half a second may not seem, people might not notice. Your coach will notice, though. And the other players might notice. But a lot of people in the audience may not notice as that ball goes through your legs or hits a little bit to the left or right and gets past you, you were delayed by half a second because you weren't practicing, right? Your brain's working a little bit slower, that muscle memory. But if you'd been practicing, you would have recognized that hit, maybe a particular bounce, boom, gotten down faster, shifted left or right faster, and that's an out rather than the ball getting past you out in the outfield and maybe them getting a double or scoring an RBI or two. It's a he I've seen games totally change on one little play like that from someone I know was not coming to practice and I knew they were moving a little bit slower. Uh, their instincts, their reflexes weren't as honed as they could be and balls would get past them constantly or it's a pop fly and they drop it. If they practice, they would have caught. See the difference? It's those little things in baseball and softball that can make or break a game. It's a game of inches. Same thing on your exams, my friends. It's a, it's a matter of does it take you five minutes to figure out how to start a problem or 25 seconds? huge difference. You do that for 5, 10, 15 problems, right? You you just didn't get to the last page of the exam. Please listen to me. Please listen to your coach. <laughs> Here we go. So I look at that and go, oh, non-standard conditions, Nernst equations. Boom. Let's go. I'm at 25 degrees Celsius. It doesn't really matter. I could give you any temperature here. So we got some line equations. We know we got our anode on the left. We got solid magnesium oxidizing to Mg2+, plus, so we're going to find that on our electrochemical tables, but backwards. I'm going to have to change the sign on that. Uh, and then we got this, oh man, more complex signs, tetrahydroxyl aluminate 3 ion. Uh, that's going to be reducing. Um, and we've got OH- minus there. Looks like we might be missing something. Ah, ha, ha. I know what it is. Because I'm like, that aluminum has to reduce to something. I have the wrong electrode. Ha, 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 ha. Where did that platinum come from? There. That makes a whole lot more sense. So the aluminum in the plus three state is going to be reducing at the cathode to the aluminum in the zero state. I was, I was looking at that going, that didn't make any sense. All right. Here's your steps. I want you to think about it this way. When you see something at non-standard conditions, boom, just like every problem we've done, write the half reactions, reduction oxidation, one's at the anode, one's at the cathode, write the overall equation, put those together and figure out your cathode reduction table straight from the electrochemical tables and the anode, which is reversed with a negative sign in front of it. From that, step two, calculate E naught cell at standard conditions and determine your 
electron number Z by combining those half reactions. We've done that for every problem. We sh that should just be boom, 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 automatic for you guys. What's new for this? Step three, calculate your reaction quotient based on the concentrations given you. This magnesium ion is 0 0.016 molar. The tetrahydroxo aluminate 3 ion is 0.25 molar. The hydroxide ion is 0.042 molar. All right. Those are not one molar, so you know this is non-standard conditions. I didn't have to state that. Once you have Q, you've got everything you need to pop that in the Nernst equation. So step four, calculate E cell at non-standard conditions using the infamous Nernst equation with the natural log. And I'm not going to give you the base 10 log. All right, give a, uh, see if you can get those equations for me real quick. How about it? Did you get this far? All right, sometimes the hardest part is finding these things on this darn electrochemical table, right? So the reduction half reaction, the cathode, which is the right-hand side of the line equation, anodes on the left-hand side. We got the tetrahydroxyl aluminate three ion, gaining three electrons to form aluminum solid and four hydroxides. And I found a cathode voltage of negative 2.310 volts. So I started here. And I just went down going, man, I don't see it. I don't see it. Flipped it over. I don't see it. It's all, it's all the way down and down to the bottom. It was way down here. Can you see the tetrahydroxyl aluminate three ion there plus three electrons giving aluminum solid plus four OH minus negative 2.310 volts. So basic solution. Seems kind of obvious. You got some OH minus there. So I found that as written, and that should happen with the reduction half reaction of the cathode. The magnesium one was pretty easy. That was right here. Da, 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 da. So there's your Mg2 plus plus 2E minus going to magnesium solid. But this is flipped, right? This is at the anode. So it's the reverse of that. So if you reverse this, we got to change the sign on the negative 2.356 volts. So I had negative, negative 2.356 volts because it's the anode. So that would be, as an anode, positive 2.356 volts. So, so the magnesium, that's not going to matter if it's a acidic or basic solution in that case. I want you to add those together. Understanding the electrons don't cancel out. See the three there and the two there? When we add those together, they need to cancel. So do the lowest common multiple of six. You got to multiply this whole equation by two in order to get six electrons. And I got to multiply that whole equation by three to get six electrons on the right so they cancel out. Give me the overall equation. Calculate E naught cell at standard conditions. So these are all at one molar. That's not how we started the problem. We're under non-standard conditions, but we're just going to calculate E naught cell at standard conditions, assuming one molar, and then add our correction factor. That's all we're going to do. And then figure out what Z is. I already told you. Pause it and do it for me. Try to work ahead of me. Don't just sit there and watch me. Try to work ahead of me. You can do this with these videos. Let's see if we match. I'm just working a few seconds ahead of you here. So I multiplied my reduction half reaction by two. I multiplied my oxidation half reaction by three to get the common multiple of six. That's why Z equals six. Our electron number is six, my friends. So I'm gonna get two times one or two of the tetrahydroxyl aluminate three ion. Two times three is six electrons. I'm gonna get three times one or three magnesium solids. That's everything on the reactant side, left-hand side of the arrow. On the right-hand side, two times one is two solid aluminums. 2 times 4 is 8 hydroxide ions. This is at 1 molar, standard conditions. Uh, and then 3 times 1 is 3 magnesium ions. And then 3 times 2 is 6 electrons. The 6 electrons cancel out. You should not end up with electrons in the overall equation while you're doing this. So we know Z is 6. So take the cathode plus the anode. So the cathode, negative 2.310 volts, straight off the electrochemical table, right? Those are reduction potentials. Plus the anode, which is the reverse of it so let's add the 2.356 volts three decimal places three decimal places i'm good to three decimal places i get 0 0.046 volts for this reaction standard conditions with concentrations of one molar for everything technically an activity of one Whew. you ready do the next step we know what our balanced equation is can you calculate q for me
Mm, right, so that's it. Now solids you don't worry about. Those are activities of one. But we're going to take the hydroxide ion concentration to the power of eight. That's going to be fun on your calculator. Times the magnesium ion concentration cubed divided by the tetrahydroxyl aluminate three ion concentration squared and the magnesium solid we don't worry about activity of one. Calculate Q for me. And then we'll plug that, if you're feeling adventurous, plug that into the Nernst equation and see what you get. Let's see how different the electron, uh, the cell potential is at non-standard conditions with the concentrations I gave you in the problem versus the one molar at non-standard conditions. Let's see if it becomes more spontaneous, right, larger than this positive, so more product dominant, or is it going to be less? Could that even jump into the negative and become non-spontaneous at different temperatures? Oh, interesting. What would be really weird is if your Q value equaled 1. <laughs> right? Then you get log of 1, which is, you get some weird stuff going on there, but that's probably not going to happen. All right, calculate Q for me. <clears throat> Did you get what I got for Q, my friends? So set it up. So I rewrote the overall equation. So take the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. So the hydroxide ion raised to the power of 8. Aluminum is a solid, don't worry about. Magnesium ion raised to the power of 3 over your reactants. Magnesium is a solid, don't worry about it. Tetrahydroxyl aluminate 3 ion squared. So look up in the original cell line notation for those concentrations at non-standard conditions I gave you. The hydroxide ion was 0.042 molar. And we're assuming we can use that in place of activities. Raised to the power of 8. The magnesium ion was 0 0.016 molar raised to the power of 3. And the complex ion was 0.25 raised to the power of 2. Two significant figures, two significant figures, two significant ding, 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 two sig figs across the board. So I get an answer of Q to two sig figs of 6.345 times 10 to the minus 16th with a vertical dash line after the second significant figure. So that's a really, really tiny value. Now, if we knew what K was, we could do Q versus K and see if this is going to be shifting towards products or towards reactants at equilibrium. But we don't know what K is, so we can't do that K. We're almost done. Plug this into the Nernst equation. Now, if you want, you can calculate log of Q, the natural log of Q, because we're going to need that term to plug it into the Nernst equation. So why don't you go ahead and do that real quick? And just calculate the log of Q. Take the natural log of 6.345 times 10 to the minus 16th. I did not say this was an extra step. You don't need to do this as a separate step. But if you've got two significant figures in your log term, you get two decimal places in your answer. Oh, so let's punch that out. So I'm going to do a natural log. I can barely see my calculator anymore. So 6.345, second function, EE, negative 16. Uh, that's a number smaller than 1, so this should be negative, right? If you take the log of a number smaller than 1, it's negative. Bigger than 1 is positive. So I get negative 34.99. Two significant digits gives me two decimal places. So I'm going to pop my vertical line there and put the next two digits, 3, 6, and that's a unitless term. That'll save you some pain when we do it in the Nernst equation. So we know Z, we know R, we know T, we know F. Uh, we haven't done the temperature yet. Let's go ahead. That was 20. Was that 25 or 25.0? I think. Where's the problem? I think that because I have it erased. I think it was 25, not 25.0. So the temperature in Kelvin will be 25 plus 273.15. You never have to show me that, but track your sig figs, right? So we're going to get 298.15 Kelvin because we're good to the ones place on the addition. So we're good to the ones place. So we end up with three significant digits in our Kelvin temperature. Watch out for that. The prior problem we did, I gave you 25.0, so we were able to shift that dashed line between the one and the five to give us four sig figs. But we're stuck with three sig figs in our temperature. Let's see if that limits us in our final answer because we have four sig figs in the log of Q term. Um, I think I forget what our uh, E naught cell, but we got some additions, we got some multiplications, so it's kind of hard to predict how the sig uh, the uncertainty is going to track through. We got to do it step by step. Let's calculate the last step. Nernst equation, my friends. All right, here's our Nernst equation. 
Do we know E not cell? Check. Do we know R? Check. Do we know T? Check. Do we know Z? Check. Do we know F? Check. Do we know log of Q? Check. E cell at non-standard conditions should be a cakewalk. But we got to do this term first. We already did the log of Q. Do all this term limited by fewest sig figs, and then do the subtraction limited by largest absolute uncertainty or fewest decimal places. What's interesting is, what if we were all at standard conditions? Wouldn't all the concentrations be one molar or an activity of one? Doesn't matter if you raise them to the power of eight or three. So isn't Q equal to one at standard conditions? It is, isn't it? What's the log of one? Zero. That whole correction factor goes to zero at standard conditions, and E cell at non-standard conditions would be E cell at standard conditions. Oh, oh, that makes sense, right? Doesn't that work out beautifully? Plug in your numbers, see if we get the if you track your uncertainty like I do. All right, we're going piecemeal here. I'm showing you how the units are going to work out. It gets a little crazy. So I plugged in E not cell. We calculated back in uh, step two, 0 0.046 volts. Go to three decimals. R, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin, provided for you. Temperature, we did, 298.15, good to the ones place. That's Kelvin. Do you see Kelvin canceling out here? Bye, temperature. Divide by Z, which is 6, that's unit list. That's our electron number we got from uh, adding our two half reactions. Um, let's divide by Faraday constant, 96,485 coulombs per mole, provided for you on exams. See how moles cancels out? We're going to be left with joules per coulomb, which is a volt. And then the log, log of Q is negative 34.9936. Good two four sig figs there, or two decimal places, actually. And that's unitless, so we're going to end up with volts minus volts. Remember, you have to subtract peanuts from peanuts. You can't subtract peanuts from anchovies. It doesn't work out. This is all multiplication, so we got uh, three sig figs, four sig figs. Our temperature is going to limit us to three significant digits. Calculate that term. See what you get for E cell for me. All right, done with my trusty calculator. So if I take 8.3145 times 298.15 divided by 6, divided by 96,485 times negative 34.9936, good to three significant figures, I get negative 0 0.14984 volts with a vertical dash line showing the three sig figs. So now I can take my E naught cell, 0 0.046 volts, subtract the correction factor for not being at standard conditions, which is negative 0 0.14984 volts. Since I'm subtracting a negative, that ends up adding. So I end up at 0 0.19584 volts. Three decimal places, three decimal places. I'm subtracting, I'm good to three decimal places. That rounds up to 0 0.196 volts. So it becomes more spontaneous, more product favored, at the non-standard conditions because that's more positive in that case. Wow! Welcome to the Nernst equation, my friends, even though we're using the natural log where he originally did the base 10 log, but I'm sorry, Mr. Nernst. <laughs> we're gonna use the we're gonna use the natural log for ours. You can do this!